back with you once again for your weekly dose of common sense political analysis that we do every week here. And uh, first of all, a little bit of a, a little bit of housekeeping to get out of the way first and foremost here. Uh, you know, we've been on the air almost a year now. We're, we're just uh, probably two or three weeks away from our first anniversary here on America's Evil Genius. And of course, a lot of you out there have followed us from day one and have been uh, very interactive with us and, and uh, sent us feedback and have been very encouraging in your comments to us. And, and I thank you for that. And, and we've uh, we picked up new viewers all the time, and we're having a lot of fun out here. I think we're uh, really starting a lot of important discussion in America, and I, I appreciate all the feedback that I get from you and the interaction that, that we have and the discussions that, that we raise in America. Uh, so we're having a lot of fun with this. But the one thing you might have noticed is that in the last 40-some-odd shows that we've done, uh, it's all kind of been the same format. It's pretty much me sitting in a chair in front of a camera and talking about whatever the political issue of the day is. We're talking about some particular topic that I find interesting. And hey, you know, that's all been well and good with the time constraints you have on YouTube and, uh, and so forth. You really can't do a lot more than that. But I'm the type of person, like, like any other uh, videographer or, or talk show host or someone's on radio or whatever, I like to constantly, constantly be looking for things that can make the show a little more interesting little different things we can do to kind of spice it up a little bit. So we are right now in the process of putting together a special series of shows that are going to do just that. Uh, going to be kind of a break from what we normally do. We're going to change things up a little bit here in the next few weeks. We're trying to make those arrangements right now. Uh, there is a local radio personality here in the St. Louis area, a local liberal radio personality named Mark Bland. And he's got a weekly show called The Q with Mark Bland. And he actually had me on that show a couple weeks back. And you can go uh, listen to his uh, archive shows over at uh, www.thequnow.com. All of his old shows are archived, and he does a, a new one every Wednesday night. I was on one of the shows a couple of weeks ago. And we had a good discussion, had a lot of fun. And uh, between you and me, don't tell Mark I said this, but I kind of kicked his ass in the debate. Shh. But nevertheless, we had a great time, had a lot of fun. And I thought, you know what would be fun? You know what would be great? I would love to bring somebody on this show, maybe talk about two or three different issues. And, you know, there's things out there that, that liberals believe that I, I just don't get. I don't understand where they're coming from. I, I don't conceptualize how they can think as they think. I'll admit it. So I'd love to have one of these guys come on this show, and I'll pick their brain about a topic or two. So I'm trying to make the arrangements with Mark Bland right now to come on this show so that uh, I can pick his brain on a couple things, and I, I can I can just kind of ask that question. My goodness, how can you liberals think that way about whatever topic? So that's what's uh, hopefully coming down the road. We're making the arrangements now, so maybe in the next three or four weeks we'll uh, we'll start putting out a couple of those shows. In the meantime, as for this week's topic, I wanted to talk about something that I actually alluded to about two or three months ago. We have heard a lot about the division in this country and how we're so divided as a nation. And we've heard a lot of this class warfare talk coming out of the, the left particularly. And a lot of times they try and reduce things to an idea of rich versus poor. Or, or sometimes they fancy it up a little bit. They talk about the 1% versus the 99% as though that's really the uh, true method of division in this country. Well, you might remember about two or three months ago on this show, I said that I do believe America is divided right now. But I thought that division was a little bit more nuanced than what the left is giving it credit for, what the, or how the left is interpreting it. I made the statement a couple of months ago that I do not believe that the division in this country is necessarily rich versus poor. And I don't believe that the uh, division in this country is necessarily the 1% versus the 99%. I think there's a little bit more to it. And I use the phrase that I believe the division in America today is the division between producers and parasites. It's producers versus parasites in this political environment of America right now. And I said that I thought this election would really be a referendum on that, would really be uh, that type of fight playing out, the producers versus the parasites. Now, some of you out there are saying, well, isn't that just a fancy way of saying rich versus poor? I say no. When I'm saying the word producer, what I mean 
is anyone who is bent on making their own way in society. Sure, that could be a wealthy person, but it could also be a middle class person, someone or even an industrious poor person. It could be someone who wants to make it in this society on their own without the expectation that their fellow man needs to you know, give them a hand out or a hand up. That whatever they do, whatever they achieve, it needs to be all on their own and that on the other side of that coin, they need to retain all of the wealth and all of the trappings and all of the rewards for having achieved it, whatever that ends up being. Those are the producers. And it's not only the wealthy, it's a lot of the middle class. I'm middle class. I fall into that category. I prefer to work for a living and make whatever I can on my own rather than to expect my neighbor or the rich guy across town to subsidize me. Versus the parasites. The parasites being the people who believe that, well, we're just all in this together and they should not be the sole arbiter of their fate in society. That the rest of us owe them at least some modicum of a living and that, that really if, if, if they haven't had opportunities, it's up to us to hand them those opportunities. And again, that's not necessarily just the poor. That can be big corporations that want to have handouts from the government. Maybe someone who's trying to start a green jobs company. Maybe you're cylinders of the world. Those type of people. So it goes well beyond just rich and poor. It goes to producers versus parasites. Producers, the ones who want to produce wealth and retain it, versus parasites, those who want the wealth handed to them, those who want their living handed to them, those who believe that we all owe them something merely for breathing air and taking up space. You may remember that discussion we had. Now, why am I bringing that up? I'm bringing that up because of last week's State of the Union address. Now, the State of the Union address that Barack Obama gave last Tuesday night was effectively a campaign speech. Now, no harm in that. I think we all understand that any first-term president, when they get to their third State of the Union speech, it is going to be a campaign speech. We get that. Every sitting president in their first term has done that. Republican, Democrat, whoever. So no harm, no foul there. But when you understand that, it makes it a little bit more interesting to watch the speech through the lens of a campaign speech and to understand that what he says in that State of the Union address is largely going to be the focus of how his entire re-election campaign is going to play out. So with that in mind, there was a particular phrase he used in his State of the Union address that, well, it sort of got under my skin when I heard it, and I was sort of offended when I heard it, but the more I thought about it over the ensuing week and the more I reflected back on it, first of all, the matter it made me, but then the more it made me, made me realize how different Obama's re-election campaign will be when compared to his 2008 election campaign. So what was that phrase that Barack Obama used in the State of Union address that, that perked my ears up, that got my antenna going? That phrase was shared sacrifice. Shared sacrifice. Basically the idea that, by golly, we're all in this together, and if if things are going to be a challenge for us, then by golly, they just need to be a challenge for everybody. And that struck me as a little bit odd. Not, not surprising that he said it. I, I'm not surprised by that at all. I think that's been a cornerstone of his politics all along. But what was interesting to me is that the usage of that phrase, particularly if he continues to use that type of phrasing and that type of, of idea through his re-election campaign, that's very different to me than 2008. Now, how is that different? Well, think back to 2008. Think back to the Barack Obama initial election campaign. What do we think of? Hope and change. Hope and change. Hope and change. It all sounded nice and, nice and warm and fuzzy, didn't it? I mean, forget the fact that what Obama was actually pushing during his election campaign was deplorable and and the ideas of spreading the wealth and all that were just something that, <laughs> frankly, no American president should ever advocate. Forget all of that. The one thing you could say about the Barack Obama 2008 campaign was that there was an air of positivity to it. He took these deplorable ideas and framed them in such a, a positive, warm and fuzzy manner that if you didn't know any better, they'd sound pretty good. They made it sound like, your life is going to be better in four years than it is now if you just elect me. Pretty typical uh, campaign strategy, but Barack Obama really pushed it to the hill, and he was successful with it. 
No question about that. So 2008 was a very positive campaign, at least in terms of how he framed his message. Contrast that to 2012. And a message of shared sacrifice? How positive is that? How warm and fuzzy is that? We've gone from a 2008 campaign where he made people feel anyway like they were going to finally get their hand up. We talked to these, these students and these minorities and these poor people. He'd make them feel like, I'm going to be the president that gives you a hand up and I'm going to help you finally achieve all that you're capable of. As ridiculous as that idea was, that was the idea that he and his handlers put out there. But a message of shared sacrifice does not give that same message. It instead infers that, yes, I, I know you believe your life sucks. And yes, I know you believe it's hopeless. But if you reelect me, I'll make sure that everybody else shares the pain that you have. I'll make sure that everybody else shares the misery that you have. That's not positive at all. It's not saying, I'm going to make your life better. It's saying, I'm going to make everybody else's life as bad as yours. It's a direct appeal to the parasites. The parasites who really don't have any inclination to better their lives and who believe that all the rest of the world owes them the very basics of their existence, he's telling them, Obama is telling those parasites that he's going to go to the producers and share that sacrifice, share that misery, so he can take some more from the producers and give to those parasites who are already living off. My goodness, how positive is that? How uplifting is that? It's not. But I guess Barack Obama thinks that there's enough parasites out there, that he's created enough parasites through his, all of his government interference and his food stamps and so forth, that he's uh, increased this, this uh, dependence on government in America. Maybe he thinks he's done enough of that, that there's enough people out there who just have given up on their lives to the extent that shared misery and shared sacrifice is good enough for them. Well, I don't think that Barack Obama is right in that regard. If that's the calculation he's making, I think he's going to be sorely disappointed. Basically, what he's doing is he is counting on the fact that enough Americans have thrown in the towel on their own potential and have thrown in the towel on their own progression in life that all that's left for them is not to achieve, not to succeed, but just to make sure that other people can't achieve or other people can't succeed. It's a very, very negative message, and I think Obama's playing on that and counting on that. He's playing right into that Occupy Wall Street playbook, but I don't think it'll work because when you really think about what the American spirit is, setting all of the political labels aside, setting aside all the Republican and Democrat and conservative and liberal and all this, when you set it all aside, this has never been a nation that has been based out of shared sacrifice. This has been a nation that has been based out of individual sacrifice and individual achievement. When those immigrants came over across the Atlantic into Ellis Island back in the 1800s, were they coming here for shared sacrifice? I doubt it. I don't think so. Most of them were actually trying to escape shared sacrifice in their homeland. Most of them were trying to escape oppression, trying to escape tyranny to come to a place where they can put a life together for themselves and their families at their own discretion. That's the American dream. But when a president is talking about and, and emphasizing shared sacrifice, he is spitting in the face of the American dream. The American dream is to have the opportunity to put a life together for yourself and ride that lightning bolt as far as you can. The American dream is not, my life sucks and my only, my only recourse is to make sure everybody else's life sucks. That's the Obama message right now. It's a message, not of hope and change, but it's a message of hopelessness and change. Barack Obama's only opportunity in his mind, evidently, is that the American people feel so hopeless that his promise of sharing that misery elsewhere will be enough to get him to vote for him. Now he's probably going to get some parasites to vote for him for that specific reason. 
But I don't know that he's going to get the middle class to come out for him that way. I think he thinks that he can unite the middle class and the poor, but I've mentioned on the show before that there's a lot of people in the middle class that don't have oftentimes a particularly high opinion of some of these parasites. And people wonder why that is, or, or they, they look at me funny when I say that, but think about something. Those of us in the middle class, we're around the parasites every day. We're around a lot of the poor every day. We interact with them at our jobs, or we interact with them on the street, or we interact with them down at the, the McDonald's where they're working the cash register or flipping the burgers, or we interact with them when they're panhandling on the street corner. Or, you know, if you've ever had your car broken into, or your wallet stolen, or your house broken into, that was probably a parasite too. I guarantee you that wasn't somebody in the 1%. But yet those are the people that the Democratic Party and Barack Obama are trying to unify us with. Well, most middle class people I know have a pretty low opinion of those who parasite and who scavenge off the rest of us for their existence. And even though a lot of us are not in the 1% financially, we sure do seem to have a little bit more in common in terms of mentality with their viewpoint on life than we do the viewpoint of those who are just looking to get a handout, looking to get some food stamps, looking to have another child so that they can have another check from the government. Even though I personally might be closer financially to the poor, my mental state and my viewpoint on America is much closer to that of your typical wealthy person. Because that's the direction I want to head. I've, I've grown up around poor people all my life. I've seen poor people. I've been around all of the, the, the food stamp queens and welfare queens you want to in rural America. And I don't want to go there. I've seen it. I want to go that way. I want to go towards the wealthy. That's, that's what, what spurs me on every day. So no... I won't react well to a message of shared sacrifice. I think it's, I think it's a horrible message. I think it's anti-American to push that. And furthermore, I believe that the, the Republican Party does not stand for shared sacrifice, at least not beyond the point that we already have shared sacrifice in America. I have mentioned it before. The wealthy in this country are already unfairly highly taxed. Yes, I said it. The wealthy are unfairly taxed at a rate that is too high. Period. And therefore, that means we're already having shared sacrifice in this country. You want to know who's not sharing the sacrifice? It's the poor. It's that at 47% of people who pay only 2% of the income taxes. That's where the unfairness is. But let's leave that aside for a second. We in the Republican Party do not stand for shared sacrifice, nor should we. We stand for individual success, for individual achievement, for individual potential. We stand for the idea that you, whoever you are, whatever color you are, whatever your situation in life, can work hard, be a little bit more cunning than the next guy, and put together a pretty good life for yourself and your kids. That you have more opportunity in this country, even if you're poor, than you will have anywhere else in the world. I will admit that right now the Republican primary, the Republican race, is far from perfect. And we, have, we certainly do not have a perfect candidate out there. I mean, Mitt Romney basically is, is out there defending Romney care. How the heck did he get in the Republican Party? Newt Gingrich, who had a great chance to overtake him, started going off rails and talking about, talking about space stations on the moon and criticizing Mitt for actually being a good businessman. Okay, that's not real good. Rick Santorum is doing a pretty good job, but he hasn't picked up the traction because he decided he was going to campaign up in New Hampshire when he had no chance of winning there instead of putting his feet on the ground in South Carolina. That was a big tactical mistake. I don't know if he can recover from it, but he sounds pretty good. And then Ron Paul is good on, on domestic policy, but is crazy grandpa when it comes to foreign affairs. So granted, nobody on the Republican side is perfect. But at the very least, for all the faults of the current Republican crop of candidates, at the very least, our debates are talking about some positive ideas. Our debates are talking about the future. Our debates are talking about how do we turn the ship around and get it going in the right direction. Now granted, all four of the remaining candidates have some different ideas about how to do that. That's why we have debates, that's why we have primaries. But all of them are focused in some way on getting America back to its rightful place in society. They see a bright future for this nation. They have slightly different methods of getting us there, but all four of the remaining GOP candidates have a positive vision for what America can once again become. 
But your president doesn't have that, that positive vision. Your president doesn't see a light at the end of the tunnel. The only thing your president sees is that some of you are pissed off, and you're so pissed off that the only thing that you want is for someone else to be as pissed off as you. No, you don't have it. But if you can't have it, you don't want anybody else to have it either. That's what this president is playing on. Now, I might be overly optimistic, but I don't think it'll work. Let's look at some recent history. When you go back from the death of Franklin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt on to today, that period of time, from the late 1940s up until present, do you realize that only one sitting Democratic president in that whole time, only one sitting Democratic president has ever been reelected to a second term? It's true. Harry Truman did not run for his second full term in 1952. John F. Kennedy tragically did not have the opportunity to run in 1964. Lyndon Johnson did not run in 1968 because he would have gotten his ass kicked. Jimmy Carter did get his ass kicked in 1980, and Bill Clinton won in 1996. Why was it that Bill Clinton was the only one of them that could win? Well, the only reason he could win was because he could take a look at the economy, he could point the American people at the economy and say, hey, it's not that bad, is it? The status quo is pretty good, isn't it? Now, I'm not praising Clinton for his economic prowess. I think a lot of that had to do with the remnants of the Reagan legacy. But be that as it may, if Clinton's the guy in office, when things are going well economically, he can point to it and he can do well with it. He was able to do that. He was able to get reelected off of that. He was able to put out, really, a positive message, flawed though it was. Barack Obama can't do that. Barack Obama cannot point to the status quo and say, hey, do you want some more of this? Most people will say, hell no, we don't want any more of this. So he can't point to the status quo. And recent history shows that when a sitting Democratic president cannot point to the status quo as a positive thing, he either loses or gets the hell out of the thing before he's humiliated. That's where Obama's at right now. And his last-ditch effort is to appeal to that lowest common denominator who feel their lives are so hopeless that the only thing they want is to make everybody else's life just as hopeless as theirs. That's all Obama's got left. That's your Obama supporter right there in a nutshell. So I'm optimistic. Because as long as the GOP, once we get past this dogfight of a primary we've got going on, all we have to do is Take a good look at Obama's record, put that up to the light, and share our ideas for how to make this country better, how to get it moving forward again. The Republican Party, contrary to what you've heard in the news, the Republican Party is the party of ideas. If you don't believe us, listen to one of our debates. You'll see a ton of ideas out there. You may not like all of them, but there's a lot of ideas being talked about right now. From flat taxes like Newt Gingrich is suddenly uh, talking about, the different things we can do with border security, different things we can do abroad, and yeah, there's a lot of disagreement with Ron Paul over that. But the bottom line is, when it comes to improving America, everybody left in this candidacy, everybody left in this debate is bringing something to the table. Barack Obama has nothing left to bring to the table other than shared sacrifice and shared misery. That's it for this week. This is America's Evil Genius. See you next week.